Resourceful Designer, Episode 34, Dealing with Deadlines. What type of designer are you? Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, I think he has a crush on Siri, Mark Decote. Welcome to Resourceful Designer. My name is Mark Decote, your host, and I hope you're doing extremely well in your graphic design business. I myself have been overwhelmed with work this past couple of weeks. I don't know if it's the nice weather of spring or what, but people have been contacting me left and right for logos and websites and all sorts of interesting projects, and I'm loving it. But I am managing to squeeze in a little bit of time here to get the podcast episode out this week. Now, before I get on with the episode, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Virgilito, who left me a five-star review on iTunes. And the review reads, I've been searching for a resource to gauge my own business and learn some new tips and tricks. This one is it. Every episode is relevant and useful. There is never any run-on and or filler. There is a good flow and it's never boring. I can't wait for the next episode. Well, thank you very much for that. I really do appreciate the review. And I would love to get many, many more of them. So if you haven't done so already, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes and that'll redirect you to my podcast on the iTunes store where all you have to do is click on the ratings and review tab and click leave a review. It's that simple. And if you don't know what to write, you can always just rate the podcast. There's a thing there where you can rate it from one to five stars and you can do so without actually leaving a review if you don't want. But the reviews are so nice for me to read. Now, another quick reminder is that the podcast is now available on Google Play Music, accessible through all your Android devices. So if you're listening to the podcast on the website, or maybe you have a friend that doesn't have an iPhone and thinks it's too hard to listen to podcasts or something, just tell them to visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash GPM or slash Google Play, both will work. And that'll redirect them to the Resourceful Designer page on Google Play Music where they can subscribe to the podcast. And if you are somebody that comes to the website every week, first of all, thank you very much for that. But if you listen to the podcast on the website and you think you might prefer to listen to it on your iPhone so you can take it around with you, be more mobile, by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, the same link that you can use to leave a review, you can also subscribe to the podcast through there on any iOS device. I haven't shared my contact information with you in a while, so I thought I would do so now and just remind you that I am on Twitter at ResourcefulD, on Facebook at facebook.com slash resourcefuldesigner, and I'm always reachable by email at either feedback at resourcefuldesigner.com or by filling out my feedback form on the website. And one last thing, if you'd like to join my email list or if you're just interested in my free marketing guide, the four-week marketing boost, You can get it by visiting marketingboost.net or if you're in the USA, simply text marketingboost, all one word, to 44222. And not only will you get my free guide, but you'll automatically be signed up for my newsletter. And now, as always, I'd like to start off the podcast with a resource of the week. And this resource is for all of you out there that use WordPress, either for your own personal website or for your client's website. And that resource is a plugin called Pretty Link. Now, hopefully you're already familiar with Pretty Link. It's used to allow you to shorten links using your own domain name. So you don't have to use stuff like TinyURL or Bitly or any other shrinking service. You can actually use your own website to shrink long names. In fact, that's how I create all the links I share with you. Resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes or slash feedback or slash Google Play or slash episode 34. All of those are pretty links, and it makes it so easy to remember and to share them with people. Now, not only does pretty link allow you to create these links, it also allows you to track how many hits you get on them, and you can get detailed reports of where the hits came from, what sort of browser, OS, and the host. It's just really, really good for keeping track if the links you're putting out there are actually working. Now, pretty link is a free plugin, But I personally use Pretty Link Pro, the paid version, and I bought the developer license. The developer license allows me to install Pretty Link Pro on as many websites, my own and my clients, as I want. 
and I get unlimited updates for the life of the product. Now, there is only one year of tech support, but with so much online help for Pretty Link, you can probably get any answers after the one year without having to renew your fee. Now, the reason I chose to upgrade to the pro version of Pretty Link are some of the added features you get with the upgrade. One of them is the Pretty Bar. Whenever you're creating a post, especially if you're creating a blog or in my case, the podcast, you can create your Pretty Link directly from your blog post page. So when I tell you that the show notes for this episode are at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 34, I created that Pretty Link directly on the posts page where I wrote up the show notes. I didn't have to go click through a bunch of different things to get into Pretty Link and create the link there. It's so easy within the amount of time it takes me to type up episode 34, the link is created. Now, some of the other features of the pro version are QR codes. You can use Pretty Link to create QR codes to different pages or different sections of websites. And one of the big features that I really like is the keyword replacement feature using Pretty Link. And what this does is it you can set up predetermined links and it'll replace keywords. For example, whenever I'm writing up a blog post, Anytime I write the word iTunes, I don't have to worry about it. Pretty Link will automatically turn the word iTunes into a link for resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes and redirect you to the podcast page in the iTunes store. The same thing with other things. Suitcase Fusion, which is my font management software of choice. With keyword replacement, anytime I type in Suitcase Fusion, Pretty Link automatically changes it into a link taking you to their store. So it makes it really easy to just quickly type up show notes or blog posts or add anything onto a page and have Pretty Link create the links for you. Now, there are many, many more features of the pro version of Pretty Link that I'm not listing here. So if you're curious and you think that Pretty Link might be something you'd be interested in, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Pretty Link. And yes, that is definitely a Pretty Link. And that'll redirect you to the page where you can find out more. Now, yes, this is an affiliate link. So if you do decide to purchase the pro version of Pretty Link, I do get a small commission on the sale. But as always, I wouldn't share these resources with you if I didn't believe in them. And I have Pretty Link installed on every single one of my clients' websites. It's always one of the first plugins I install. So that's this week's resource of the week. And now, dealing with deadlines. Now, before I get into dealing with deadlines, first, let me give you a definition of what a deadline is. According to Webster's Dictionary, a deadline is a date or time when something must be finished. The last possible day, hour, minute, second, the something will be accepted. Now, I know I don't really have to give you the definition of a deadline. I mean, you are a graphic designer after all, so you know all too well what a deadline is. But what I really want to touch on is not exactly what a deadline is, but how a deadline comes to be. I mean, what I'm getting at is, who decides on the project that you're working on? Who decides when it needs to be done? What specific time or date it has to be finished? I mean, the obvious answer is your client. But you would be surprised how many times the designer actually dictated the deadline thinking it was the client that was doing so. I've encountered this problem so many times, especially amongst newer or inexperienced graphic designers. When they start discussing a project with a client and they see the client's enthusiasm for the project, they're all excited about this thing moving forward. And the designer misinterprets this enthusiasm as a desire to have the job done quickly. And then what happens is the designer actually imposes a deadline on the job themselves. And sometimes it's all because of the conversation with the client. When I used to work in the design department of a commercial printer, we had a production coordinator. Now, this was the person that would gather up all the jobs every morning and distribute them to the different graphic designers in the shop. Now, he was also in charge of making sure that the jobs went through the design department into pre-press, onto the press, then onto the finishing department and get ready for the clients to pick them up. So he would coordinate production through the entire building. Now, because his office was right up front, he was usually one of the first people to greet a new client when they'd come in with some sort of job for us to do. Now, of course, most of the time they would have a designer, one of us, go up and talk to the client because we're the ones going to be working on the job. But he would often be there because he would need to coordinate this job 
it's a lot easier for him to know and to schedule the project through the entire shop if he heard firsthand from the client what exactly is involved. Now, I can't tell you how many times I was discussing a job with a client with the production coordinator at my side. And at the end of the conversation, the client would ask, how soon before I see a proof? And my production coordinator had the bad habit of interpreting this as the client needs to see a proof as soon as possible. And before anybody could say anything, he would tell the client that a proof would be ready within maybe two days, three days, by the end of the week, whatever. And sometimes this would be forcing the design department to actually rush on the project to get it done. And what's really maddening is often the client would respond to this by saying something like, wow, I wasn't expecting it that fast, or I thought it would take at least two or three weeks, but two days, three days, that's great. As I said, it was really maddening because we could have had a lot more time to work on the project, but because the production coordinator would misinterpret what the client was saying as the client needs the job in a rush, he would automatically assign a proof deadline much, much sooner than really need be. And what's really maddening about this is he he did it over and over and over again, no matter how often we told him not to let that happen. And I've seen that with new designers. I've talked to new designers or inexperienced designers, or when I say inexperienced, I should say those that are running their own business. They may be really good designers, but they might be new at running their own business. And I've seen this happen where in order to please the client, they're creating deadlines for themselves that are much more unrealistic than what the client was actually expecting. Because when a client says, how soon can I see a proof? It doesn't necessarily mean that they're in a big rush to see it. They just want to get an idea. Is it going to take two days or is it going to take two weeks? So when you're discussing time frame and schedules with a client, let the client dictate when the deadline is instead of accidentally assigning one to yourself and creating more trouble for you. Now, once the deadline is determined, whether client tells you that there is this deadline that he needs it for, or you decide to tell the client that they'll have it at a certain time, after that deadline is determined, you have to set yourself some interim deadlines. What this means is once you actually have the project assigned to you and there is a deadline assigned to that project, you need to do some backtracking to figure out what your actual deadline is. As an example, let's say you're designing a brochure for a client and they need this brochure for a trade show that's happening on the 30th of the month. Well, that's great. Maybe we're the second or third of the month. So you say, wow, wow, we've got 27 days. We've got the whole month to proof, work, and do all this on this brochure. we got lots of time. But in fact, there's a lot of other things to take in consideration. For one, where is the trade show? Does the client need to ship these brochures? If he does, maybe he'll need an extra day or two. So now the trade show is on the 30th. The client might actually need these brochures for the 27th or 28th, depending on where they're going. Now, the other thing to take into account is the printer. How difficult is it to print these brochures and how busy is the printer? So you should definitely contact the printer. Even if you're not the one dealing with the printer directly, you should find out what is the deadline the printer needs. And they'll tell you how much time they need in order to get the job through printing, through trimming, through folding, through their bindery, and then packaging it all up for delivery or pickup. And they may need several days for that, which eats into your final deadline. So now the 27 days you had that dropped down to, say, 24 because the client has to ship the things, and then the printer says they need five days, so now you're down to 19 days before you have to submit the files to the printer. Now, other things to take into consideration is how long will it take you to do revisions? You haven't even designed the piece yet, but you have to think, how long will it take for you to do revisions on the piece? And if you think revisions will take, say, three or four days, well, then you're 19 days just drop to 15 days. Then you got to think, okay, I'm going to submit some proofs to the client, but how long is the client going to sit on these proofs? Are they going to get back to me right away or will they take a day or two? Let's say the client take two days to get back to you. Well, now your 15 days is down to 13 days. And then finally, you have to add in some padding there for anything that's unforeseen. What happens if there's a problem at the printer? The printer says they need five days. But what happens if one of their presses breaks down or something happens and you need some extra time there? So maybe you'll add a day or two on for when you submit the printing files. 
Maybe your client has to get approval from a lot of different people and you think maybe two days isn't enough, maybe three or four days for them to hold on to the proof before getting back with revisions. And maybe there'll be multiple revisions. So you subtract a couple of days just to be safe. And that leaves you with somewhere between seven and nine days to work on this project. So the client gave you a final deadline saying that they need this by the 30th of the month, which is 27 days away. But in reality, you have to have the job completed within let's say, eight days. So that is your deadline. And this is the sort of thing that you have to be used to doing, especially if you're working on your own, you're running your business out of your home. You don't have an art director or somebody, some sort of project manager that's overseeing all this stuff. You have to take care of all these things and figure these things out. Now, you might give yourself eight days to work on this, but this might not be your only project. So now you've got to juggle okay, I've got eight days to finish this, but I also have these projects to work on. And and how are you going to mix and match all these projects to get this one project done in eight days so that the client can have the brochure in hand at the trade show that happens on the 30th of the month? So now, after all of this, you have a deadline. And whether that deadline is two days away, eight days away, maybe it will be 20 some days away, depending on the project. Maybe the trade show is not at the 30th of the month, but three months from now, in which case it gives you more time and you got to calculate it all differently. But once you've done all that calculation and you have your deadline, when you have to be finished with the artwork and have the final files ready to give to the client, give to the printer, ship off wherever you, they may have to go, you have that deadline in place. So now that's the deadline that you have to deal with. But how do you deal with that deadline? When you're dealing with deadlines, it's all about balance. And if you can't learn how to balance your deadlines, you'll forever be struggling between doing the job well and getting the job done on time. Let me give you a crazy analogy here. Imagine you're sitting down for a holiday feast. You're surrounded by family and friends, and they put a very large plate of delicious looking food in front of you. Imagine there's some turkey, a little bit of ham, some really nice mashed potatoes. There's some stuffing and lots of steamed vegetables. Maybe there's some cranberry sauce and a pasta salad, a little bit of coleslaw, maybe even some of those homemade meatballs that only grandma can make. And everything looks so good that you just can't wait to dig into your plate. But there's so much food on that plate and you're not sure that you can eat it all. So what do you do? Do you make your way around the plate, sampling a little bit of this and a little bit of that until finally you're full? Or do you eat a little bit of this and a little bit of that, leaving your favorite part? Maybe it's the turkey. You leave that favorite part for last so you can savor that taste and finish off the meal with that. Or are you the type of person that immediately dives in and eats up all the turkey because it's your favorite, because you're afraid you may run out of room and feel full? before you have had a chance to finish it. So you eat it all up and then finish off with the other things. After all, you wouldn't want to leave that delicious morsel of turkey left on the plate, would you? So how you decide to eat your meal all depends on what type of person you are. Now, I I know this analogy is a little slim compared to graphic design, but really, when you're dealing with deadlines, it's pretty much the same thing. When you're dealing with deadlines, there's really only three kinds of graphic designers. Those who tackle the project right away and try to get it done as soon as possible with lots and lots of time to spare, and then they move on to the next project. And then there are those who work on the project diligently in little chunks from the time it's assigned to them until the deadline arrives. And finally, there are those who wait until the deadline is almost upon them before finally starting the project. Now, I know there's many arguments to say which of these methods is best, and I don't know which one you are, I know which one I am, but it all comes down to you, the designer, and how you handle the pressure of dealing with deadlines. Now, I may be wrong, but I want to give you my own personal opinion on these three types of designers. As I said, I may be wrong, but this is just my opinion. But I think those who tackle the project as soon as they get it are really doing themselves a disservice. I don't think they're spending enough time thinking about the project before starting their design. And because of this, I feel that they're not putting their best effort into the project. I'm not saying that the design they come up with won't be a really, really good design, but I think it could have been much, much better if they would have spent more time on it. 
Now, obviously, if they get it done way before the deadline and there's still a lot of time left, they could always go back and revisit it or expand on it. But these type of people tend to finish the project and when it's done, they'll move on to the next project and forget about this one. They'll put it out of their mind. And I know when I worked at the print shop, there was designers like that. There was several designers there. At one point, there were six of us working there. Most of the time, there was three or four. But I remember one person that that was the way it was. Every morning, they would be assigned these projects and they would try to get them done as fast as possible. And I always felt that sometimes the design in these was lacking because of that rush to get the job done and move on to the next project. Now, the second sample I gave you was a designer who deals with deadlines by working them in chunks. They get assigned the job, so they'll start working on it a little bit, and then they'll move on and work on another job, and then another job. Then they'll come back to that first job, do a little bit more there, and all the time keeping track of when their deadline is, and they'll keep juggling the different jobs so that that one project, they finish it just in time for the deadline. It's done, they submit it, they did a good job, and they're happy with it. But... These designers too, I also think they're doing themselves a disservice. Yes, they're working diligently on the project and they may not feel the pressure of the deadline looming over them because they're doing it in little chunks. They're progressing. They're seeing some progress along the way. But I think that by breaking up their time this way, they're constantly disconnecting themselves from the project. They're taking their mind out of it and to work on something else. And then they'll go work on some other project. Then they come back to this one. And it's kind of like they're splitting their focus between all these different design projects. And I think that could hurt their overall vision and the design that they're creating. And again, I saw people like this at the print shop and elsewhere as well. But I I like to use the print shop as my example because that's what I know the most in the agency type graphic design world. And there were designers there that worked this way. They would be assigned a bunch of jobs and they'd work a little bit on one job, then a little bit on another and keep coming back and rotating. They would always get their jobs done on time, but it just seemed like it was taking a long time or longer than normal because when they would step away from a design and then come back to it, it always took that little period where they had to get readjusted and refamiliarize themselves with that design. So those designers, I think, even though they created nice designs, probably spent more time on the project than it really merited. And when you're working for yourself and you're trying to either bill by the hour or by the project, the idea is to do the best work in the least amount of time. And if it takes you five, 10 minutes to refamiliarize yourself with the file, with your design, like if you're going into Photoshop or Illustrator and you have to try to remember what all the different layers are because you haven't worked on this project in a couple of days and you're going back and saying, okay, this layer is this, this layer, okay, now I get it. Now you get back to work. Well, that five, 10 minutes or whatever it took, even if it was a minute or two, that's time wasted that you could have been doing something else. Now, the way I was just talking about these last two types of designers, you could probably guess now that I fall into the third category. I'm the type of designer who usually leaves a project close to the deadline before actually starting it. And I've always been that way. When I was in college, I would always wait till the last minute to work on my projects. When I was at the printing shop, it used to drive the production coordinator nuts because he knew what my deadline was and he'd say, Mark, how's this project coming along? And I'd keep telling him, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. He used to hover over me to try to make sure I got it done. And I always got the job done in time. And I personally... Maybe I'm biased because this is the way I work, but I personally think this is the best way to do it. And let me tell you why. And you may think I'm wrong. And if you do, please leave me a comment on the show note page at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 34 and tell me why you think I'm wrong or what type of designer you are and why you think that's better than the way I do things. But let me tell you why I think the designers who wait closer to the deadline to start the project usually end up doing a better project in the least amount of time. Okay, we're creative people, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't be graphic designers. Now, that creativity means that we're able to visualize things in our mind. We're able to play with layouts, with fonts, with colors, everything, all within the confines of our head, long before putting those visions to paper or to pixels, depending. And I'm sure you've experienced it just like I have, when you get a phone call from a client and maybe the client is asking for a logo, somebody calling you up for the first time and saying, I'd like you to design a logo for my business. And they start describing what their business is and what their mission statement is. 
and a little bit about themselves. And as you're listening to the designer, you can't help but in your head, you're already designing that logo. They tell you what the business name is. Well, in my mind, I know I start going through, how would that look in a serif font, in a sans serif font? What sort of colors are going to be involved? Is there going to be a design element, some sort of icon or something to go with the logo? These are all things that I know start going through my head as I'm discussing things with the client. Same thing goes for a website, for a brochure, for a billboard, for a car wrap, for a t-shirt design. Anytime I start talking to a client about something, I've already got that design started in my head before I ever hang up that phone. Now, I know this isn't limited to, as I said, the designers who wait closer to the deadline. In fact, all three types of designers I'm talking about, I'm sure start off this way. And that's to be expected. After all, we are creative people, as I said. But it's how you handle that project after you hang up the phone that really matters. You see, the first type of designer will start that project right away. They've got that idea in their head and they start developing it either sketching it out or maybe getting in front of their computer and start doing stuff in Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever. But the problem is, is sometimes that first idea that popped in their head might not necessarily be the best idea, or it might not even work the way they're thinking it. Because sometimes you can imagine something in your head, but when you go to put it down on paper or you go to put it on your computer, you realize that things don't work out exactly the way you imagined it. What they end up doing is spending a lot of time developing what might not be the best idea. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. In fact, the client may love it, but I think it could have been much better if they would have spent more time exploring it before actually building it. Now, yes, they could probably put it on the computer or start sketching it out and realize the idea is not that great and then expand or or alter it or, or go a different direction. But then they're spending a lot of time wasted in doing those steps and process. Now, the second type of designer, the ones that starts and stops and and does the job in little chunks, they may start a project, start a design, and then as they step back, they might have some revelation or idea that pops into their head that they could try something different. But what happens is they've already started along one path. They've started creating a design. And sometimes they really want to see that design through before they might contemplate something else. So it makes it a lot harder. If they got a new idea in their head, it makes it a lot harder to go back to the computer or go back to the sketch pad and scrap their original idea in order to start something new. It's really hard to do that, or for most people it is. And again, this is wasting a lot of time going back to the drawing board, if you will. So now let's look at that third type of designer, the one who actually hasn't put anything down on paper yet hasn't sat in front of the computer. In fact, they've been working on other stuff, but in their mind, they're designing this job. Ideas have been brewing ever since they first heard about the project, were first given the project. And these ideas have been changing. They've been evolving. Some have been growing. Some ideas have been dismissed. Other ideas might be picked apart and rearranged into something different, something better, sometimes worse, but it's all happening in their head. And this allows them to explore different directions, try different things. Now, sometimes they might jot a little sketch down on a scrap piece of paper, just something to keep fresh for whenever they actually do sit down. But they're not spending a whole lot of time working out these things. And they're doing all of this as the deadline is approaching. Now, when the time finally comes to sit down, like in my case, if I know the deadline's coming up and I've had a week to work on something, I might not touch it until two or three days before the deadline. But all that time before it, I've been thinking about it. So that by the time I finally get to my sketch pad or the time I finally get to my computer, I've got a very clear picture in my mind of what I want to do. And I'm able to spend a much shorter amount of time implementing that idea as the first two types of designers would have spent on theirs because they had to spend time working on a design and then altering it. Or in the case of the first designer, might have spent a short amount of time, but the design might not be as good as it could have been if they would have spent more time thinking about it. So in the end, I think the third type of designer who had more time thinking and contemplating what they were going to do, fine-tuning their vision, probably comes up with a much better concept, a much better design in a much shorter amount of time than the other two designers. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who quoted give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening my axe. 
Well, that's exactly the concept I'm trying to get at here for graphic designers, especially when we're dealing with deadlines. If you know you have a fixed amount of time before you have to get the job done, the more time you spend thinking and refining your design in your head before you actually start the design, the faster you'll be able to get that design done when you finally sit down to do it. And it'll probably end up being a better design, just like Abraham Lincoln spent all that time sharpening his axe. When it finally came time to put metal to tree, that axe was so fine-tuned that it was extremely easy to chop through the wood. It's the same thing for design. So as I said, I might be biased because it's the type of designer I am. I prefer think on a job long and hard before actually sitting down to work on it. And this partners very well with my way of pricing my jobs, which is project-based pricing or value-based pricing. And if you want to know more about how to price a graphic design job, listen to Resourceful Designer episode 11, which you could find at the pretty link, resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 11, which was pricing strategies for your graphic design business. But I say that my method works well with that because I price something by the job most of the time, if not value-based pricing, depending on the client. But if I tell a client it's going to cost them $500 for a logo, and I think about that logo for several days, different ideas in my head, and then finally sit down and take two hours to create that logo that the client absolutely loves, then I just made $250 an hour creating a logo, as opposed to somebody who broke it up in chunks and might have ended up working four hours on the logo because of them breaking it up. And even though they charge the same amount, they're making much less per hour than the way I would do it. So as I said, this is just my thinking. Maybe you think completely different. And if so, please leave me a comment on the show notes page, resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 34. But what I'm trying to say is give yourself time to think about your design before diving in. Maybe you don't have to wait till the deadline is approaching or looming over you. But it's never a good idea to get a job from a client and start working on it right away. I mean, I'm not perfect. I've done that before. I've gotten off the phone with a client after discussing a job and immediately sit down and start doing the idea I had in my head even before the contract was signed. But I can tell you, most of the times I've done that, I either didn't follow through with that design or it was one of those designs that you're happy with, but I don't know if it was really portfolio worthy. And when you're a graphic designer running your own business, everything you put out should be portfolio worthy. So if you're the type of person who doesn't deal well with the pressure of deadlines, then don't wait until the last minute. Give yourself enough time to get the job done, but also give yourself enough time to do the job right and to the best of your ability. As I said, dealing with deadlines is all about balance. And once you learn how to master that balance, you're on your way to becoming a better and much more proficient graphic designer. So that's my episode for this week. I know this one will be a little bit controversial because I know in my career, in the over 25 years I've been doing graphic design, I've met all different types of designers. And as I said, some of them like to work on stuff right away. Some of them like to work on projects in chunks. And others, like me, like to wait. Some call it procrastination. I don't because in my mind, I'm not procrastinating. I'm just designing it in my head while I'm doing other things. I'm thinking about the job while I'm mowing my lawn, while I'm doing my dishes, while I'm doing billing, while I'm watching TV. My mind never stops. And when the time comes to sit down and do the job, I know I'm going to be doing a really good job because of the effort my mind took in creating the vision that I'm about to produce. So that's this week's topic, dealing with deadlines. What type of designer are you? Now, I do have another question of the week this week, and this week's question came in from Amy. She says, hi, Mark. My name is Amy. I'm from Pensacola, Florida, and I'm opening a graphic design studio. And I'm so grateful to have found your podcast. Thanks for all your invaluable content. I was wondering if you could share a little about profit margin. What is the typical profit margin for a small boutique graphic design studio? We won't be offering web service at first, just traditional print design branding stuff. Any insight you could share? Thanks so much, Amy. Well, thank you for that, Amy. And congratulations on opening your own design studio. Now, profit margin when it comes to anything like this will differ by so many factors. One, your location. So you being in Florida, me being in Ontario, Canada, obviously things will work differently. Just like somebody that's overseas in Europe or Asia or 
or even somebody down in South America. Profit margins will be different. It's all dictated by where you are and what you're capable of doing. Your experience will also affect your profit margin. Somebody who's been in the business for over 20 years will have a different profit margin from somebody that's only been in for three or four years, even if they're in the same general location. So this is a really, really hard question to answer. And it also depends on how you price your jobs. Are you just billing by the hour? Are you billing by the project? Or are you doing value-based pricing? I mentioned earlier episode 11 of the podcast where I talk about these three methods. Now, I know when it comes to stuff like markup, like printing and other services, I think the general norm is somewhere around the 30%, sometimes 20, sometimes 40, but generally the start off figure is 30%. And then you kind of play with it from there. So that's the sort of thing like, say you're getting something printed for your client or you hire a copywriter and you're the one paying the copywriter, you'll usually tack on maybe 30% onto the cost that the copywriter charges you or the web developer charges you or the printer charges you. Now, in some cases, you might think that's too much and you'll lower it. And in other cases, depending on where you're getting the work, if you have a web developer that's in a country that charges much, much less than they do in the U.S., then maybe your profit margin will be much, much higher. Now, you did mention that you're not into web right now, but maybe it's something else. Maybe somebody wants a very nice print design and you need to hire an illustrator who has a very special technique or illustration style. And you could hire somebody in the States for a certain price, but you may be able to hire somebody from overseas that can do just as good a job for a fraction of the price that somebody in the U.S. will charge. Well, obviously, your profit margin will be much different in those cases. You might be able to charge 10, 20, or 30% on the illustration you get from the American illustrator, where another illustrator, you might be able to charge 200, 300% markup on their things. But when it comes to pricing your own services, and I'm not talking about contractors or freelancers or farming stuff out or getting stuff printed, when I'm talking about your own design services, a lot of your profit margin has to be determined, as I said, by your location. By your overhead, I work from home. So basically, I don't have very much overhead. I don't have to worry about paying rent. I don't have to worry about electrical costs because all of that is part of my home. I get to deduct some of stuff, which, which is great, but I also don't have to work that into my overhead, really. I only have a very few things. My computer, which is part of my business. I have a dedicated internet, which is part of my business, but a lot of other stuff I don't have to worry about. But because of my very low overhead, I have a much higher profit margin. So you got to look at that sort of stuff. If you're starting a studio, are you starting a studio out of your home? Are you renting a space? Obviously, these are going to make a big difference in your profit margins. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it's just you got to look at certain things. If you're working from home, you might be able to easily get away with charging $50 an hour, $70 an hour, where if you're renting a studio space, in order to get by, you might have to charge $90 or $100 an hour. So there's so many things to take into consideration. And I don't know if I can give you an accurate answer, Amy. I really wish I could. But my best advice for you is to probably try to find out what other designers in your area are charging around the ballpark that they are, and then place yourself somewhere in that vicinity. And if you're well-established, if you're a well-established graphic designer and you have some background in the industry, maybe you can actually position yourself above what's in your area. As I mentioned before, I've I don't remember what episode it was of the podcast. I talked about how I was actually losing jobs because my prices were based on the city that I live in, but I'm an hour away from Ottawa and I'm an hour away from Montreal, which are two of the bigger cities in Canada. And those designers charge a lot more than I charge. And I was losing jobs. And the reason being is I wasn't taken seriously because my prices were so low compared to designers in those cities. And when I actually raised my prices, which of course gave me a bigger profit margin, by raising my prices, I started becoming more competitive and getting more of these jobs from the big city. So these are all things to take into account. Anyways, I wish I could have been more help there, Amy, but I really do appreciate you reaching out and submitting a question for the podcast. Now, if anybody else would like to send in a question, I really would appreciate it. You can do so by visiting my feedback page at resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit a question there. So that's it for this week's episode. Once again, I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to leave a review for the podcast in iTunes, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes. And once again, the resource of the week is PrettyLink, or more specifically, PrettyLink Pro. 
which is what allows me to produce all these really great links, such as resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes and the likes. So if you're interested in, in the free version of Pretty Link or the paid version of Pretty Link Pro, which offers so many more features, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Pretty Link. And that'll take us to the end of the podcast. Now, next week's episode, I'm going to discuss feeling overwhelmed in your graphic design business. Until then, I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best in your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.